We'll give people a minute to log in here. Hello, everyone. We are going to start in a minute. I'd like to give people a minute or two to log in. But while we are waiting, feel free to use the chat box to say hello, introduce yourself, and tell us what, you're, what firm you're tuning in from. Alrighty, let's get started. Welcome everybody. I'm Lauren Oglesby. I'm the coordinator for content communication programs here at AIA New Orleans. Thank you all so much for joining us today. This is the eighth webinar in our series, Storytelling with Architects. And today we're very excited to hear from celebrated local architect, Steve Dumez, who will be in conversation with AIA New Orleans board president, Terry Dreyer. A quick note up top about the format. This is a webinar, which means all participants will be muted, uh, but you can use the Q&A or the chat box to submit questions. This uh, presentation will be recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel at a later date. And then last note is that we are a small team, so unfortunately we don't have any capacity to troubleshoot or answer IT questions for you during the webinar. Uh, you should have received a backup call-in number sent to your email earlier today. So if you do have any troubles, please use that number. And if you are calling in uh, from your phone, uh, please do email your name and AIA number to me, lauren at aianeworleans.org, so that we can get you credit for the session. Today on the agenda, we have Steve Dumas and Terry Dreyer, and then we'll have a short Q&A session, and then we will wrap up by letting you know about some of the future events that we have coming up. In over 25 years of professional practice, Steve Dumas has led the design of complex projects in a wide range of building types. As Director of Design for SQ Dumas Ripple, he has been the re recipient of numerous prestigious awards for design excellence including more than 25 national design awards and an additional 100 plus awards at the local, state, and regional levels. Steve is a past president of AIA Louisiana and AIA New Orleans and serves as an active professional mentor within the region. He has also chaired AIA design awards programs at the local, state, and regional level and has served on numerous design awards juries across the country. He's actively engaged in many local civic organizations and currently serves on the board of the Contemporary Art Center of New Orleans. His projects have been recently published in several books, as well as numerous national architectural and design magazines, such as Architect, Architectural Record, Contract, and Interior Design. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us. We will turn it over to you and Terry now. Good afternoon. Steve, this is Terry. Welcome to World Architecture Day. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got here? Well, thanks, Terry, and thanks uh, AI New Orleans for, uh, for having me. Um, so uh, I guess I could start from uh, the beginning. Hard to believe it was that long ago and and these zoom calls are always difficult because you don't get to see the reaction of everybody in the room so uh, pardon me for the for the attempt at humor here but i figured i'd start by um by going back to uh the fact that i was born and raised in uh, louisiana south of uh, south of new orleans in Houma, louisiana and uh you know over the past gosh 62 years now 
Uh, there were times when I had hair, although most folks won't remember it. And yes, Terry's checking out that uh, tuxedo, I'm sure, the ruffle feathers um, uh, sort of give the date away in 1970, 76. Um, but uh, uh, I, I just thought I'd touch a little bit on my background and the path that I took to end up where I am. Um, went to LSU uh, as an undergraduate. It was the, the, my first move away from HOMA. Um, I studied for, uh, for five years at LSU um, and then uh, left to come to New Orleans uh, to work at Perez and, and Tara, I believe, I believe it was right around that time that we first crossed paths when you were working as a, as a young intern in the office and I had just joined the studio. Um, worked for four years there before leaving to join uh, Alan Eskew, who I'd worked with at Perez uh, when he started his firm, Eskew Vote Salvato and Filson, and then made a decision to leave to go away for graduate school. Uh, I went to Yale, uh, studied for two years, and while I was in school, worked with Cesar Pelli and Associates, uh, and then um, made a decision to move out to the West Coast, had a chance to go to the Urban Innovations Group and uh, both teach at UCLA and work at UIG. UIG was, um, <clears throat> and actually Ron Filson had worked with Charles Moore back at that time, um, or, or sorry, back in the, in the 70s at UIG. Ron had suggested uh, to me that I consider UIG. Uh, Urban Innovations Group was the practice arm um, for the School of Architecture at UCLA. So it was, it was um, a professional practice that utilized interns. And so we, we had a charter. It was a nonprofit, although one might say what architect is not a nonprofit, uh, certainly these days. Um, but no, it was a nonprofit that was established to give internships to students. Um, the running joke was I had hair until, uh, until I worked at UIG. Um, Alan then recruited me back to New Orleans. I joined S.Q. Filson, joined Alan and Ron <clears throat> back around 1994, and then have been here, uh, uh, have, has been here ever since, so. Wonderful. Um, do you have any mentors in the field? And um, I'm highly impressed with all those awesome, beautiful tuxedo outfits. Yes. Well, I'm, I knew you would be, Terry. That's very just for you. Um, well, actually, yes, I mentioned a number of mentors uh, uh, in, that, in that little piece. But uh, going back to school, I was, I was lucky at LSU to have the chance to study under um, Bob Heck, who taught architectural history and who imparted a real love for um, an understanding of architecture through time and the fact that architecture has always been about a set of ideas um, uh, and, and was always of a specific time and place. Also had the chance to study under Julian White, who was um, a, a major influence on my career, um, as well as Charles Colbert. And I, told a story about Charles Colbert. My partner, Mark Ripple, and I shared the story that Chuck um, would often pull us aside and say, architecture is a really piss poor way to make a living. And then he'd, he'd smile and he said, if you care. And so, you know, the idea that we all care about what it is that we do was, um, was something that was, was clear to him and was clear in the way in which he he imparted um, an architectural education. Um, when I studied at Yale, I had a chance to uh, study with some significant teachers and practitioners. Um, Mario Gondosonis, who was uh, uh, teaching also at Princeton and practicing, his second was Kevin Kennan, uh, whose father, Paul Kennan, was part of uh, CSRS out of, out of Houston. And so he also became an architect. He was, um, he was an assistant uh, for both Mario Gonosonis' studio as well as Michael Dennis' studio and um, developed a set of strong 
friendships and relationships from my experience at Yale. George Rinaldi also was a major influence. So I ha had a chance uh, through school to have um, individuals who had a significant impact, but then also on the work side, um, <clears throat> all the way back to Perez, where I mentioned Alan Eskew, I, I, I worked on the 1984 Louisiana World Exposition with Alan, um, but also had a chance to work with both Bill Turnbull and Charles Moore, um, then with Alan and uh, Leonard and Lloyd and Ron at EBSF, uh, a chance to, to work with W.G. Clark and, and Chuck Davis on the New Orleans Aquarium and on the Charleston Aquarium. So those were, um, those were important influences before I left. And then Pelly's office was pretty significant just to work in a practice that was, that was uh, that um, uh, doing work of that caliber and that scale. Um, but then at, at UIG, I also had the chance to um, re-engage with Charles, worked on a number of projects with him, including some, some uh, hands-on uh, participatory workshops that he uh, had instituted around the time that he did um, St. Matthew's Church out in the Pacific Palisades. We did a couple of university projects in a museum uh, together. Richard Weinstein, who was the dean at, LSU, uh, dean at UCLA, I worked with, and then Harry Wolf. I did a number of competitions with Harry, um, who also uh, was a, a, a major influence and, and mentor, and um, still keep in touch with him. He's now retired in, in Porto, Portugal. So. It's been lucky in that regard to have uh, uh, have mentors such as that, and, and and you know the large influence obviously was Alan. Sure, he was incredible, and uh, your work's outstanding. And I'm I'm hugely jealous. But moving forward, <laughs> um, I love the Toulouse Governmental Center too. Um, I want to ask you, stepping back, why did you become an architect and, and what do you feel really inspires your work? Well, um, I, I made a decision to become an architect uh, actually in the eighth grade in high school. Um, I, I had to do some drafting for shop class. We were in woodworking and you had to learn to draw what it was that you were going to build and I had a facility for that, but I'd always enjoyed drawing and sketching um, uh, as a child and all the way through. But um, also my, my grandmother lived in Bashery, Louisiana, and we used to visit her all the time. And, and most trips, we would take a drive out to Oak Alley. And I can still remember as a child driving up River Road. Um, and as you as you drive the twists and turns of River Road kind of leading up to Oak Alley, we, we would, as children, always anticipate the moment where the oaks would snap into focus, right? You, you'd see it obliquely and then you knew that the, there was gonna be this moment and just the power of the architecture and the landscape, the relationship of those two was a huge influence. Um, and I think probably also contributed to uh, my desire to be an architect. Um, uh, just the, the beauty of the setting, the relationship of the architecture to the landscape, and um, uh, just the chance to have uh, to experience that. So that was, that was one influence and was probably the formative influence. Um, in, terms of, in terms of, you know, how we work and I think of architecture today, you know, the, this idea of landscape is still a critical one and the relationship of our buildings, the way in which we, we can build in a landscape uh, that is as dynamic a, as ours is, is, really, um, is really influential. Um, the reality though, is that um, the landscapes that we find ourselves working in today are probably as much artificial as they are natural. And so, you know, the, the urban context that we're building in uh, certainly is, but New Orleans in particular which had its foundation um, in, in the landscape having to do with the river, the, the first high ground that had uh, an opportunity um, uh, to be settled easily, uh, 
puts us today in at, at, at risk, right? And so, you know, since its founding, uh, New Orleans has worked sometimes uh, counterintuitively, um, if you look at the images on the right, to really separate ourselves from the, the natural qualities of where it is that we, have, we are building. And so I've, I've been interested in this idea of infrastructure and the influence that it has, but also the relationship um, uh, that we play in terms of uh, building uh, resilient, uh, resilient architecture that really connects us to place. Um, another influence has been art and uh, uh, its impact. Uh, I had a chance when I moved out west to do a lot of traveling uh, to some of the uh, some of the land works uh, that were built out in the desert. I had a chance to visit uh, Walter de Maria's lightning field. Um, unfortunately, there was no lightning. Uh, and, uh, and, and also, you know, the chance to, um, to visit Nancy Holt's sun tunnels. Um, Michael Heiser's double negative in the um, in the desert outside of Las Vegas. There were, there were a lot of opportunities to travel uh, out west and experience some of this um, some of this artwork. And the takeaway for me was uh, just the power with very minimal means to really create experience. And I think that's what those are. They really help us both define and understand our place in the world with um, uh, with very simple but very critical moves, uh, in this case with art in the landscape. And, and I think it uh, is instructive in the way in which we might think about architecture uh, in the landscape. And so the, those were all uh, influences for me. Oh, that's great. Uh, just note to self, five year, my five year wedding anniversary, I went to the lightning fields. Didn't see any lightning, but I had a great time and some wonderful lasagna. Ah, uh, yes, the, the lasagna. I had the lasagna too. I guess they, they really served good. the same dish. I know, right? It was really good. Um, but, very but nice. It, it also, the you know the fact that you didn't have lightning, I didn't have lightning. Certainly, you know, it would have been an incredible experience to be there with lightning. But it would. But I'm sure you would agree. Just the power of that installation in the landscape. Um, was almost reason enough to be there. Oh, um, yeah. I didn't okay. need the lightning. We actually got a ton of lightning. Unfortunately, we got all the lightning driving out there <laughs> as we went past the, the very large array. Um, all the lightning was striking uh, at the VLA, so. Isn't that funny? Um, no, it, I agree. It was, it was pretty, it was phenomenal, the scale, the scalar shift and, and something small like you said, an incidental becomes so powerful in such a huge landscape. So is your is there a particular firm philosophy that you would describe your firm philosophy? Any is that you, you know, can you talk a little bit about the philosophy? Well, um, sure. Uh, I pull up this slide, you know, for, for years we um, talked about uh, the core values of the practice and um, you know Alan really established these and we we worked to articulate them over the years um, and and so these four core values were were critical and um, we would bring them to uh, to every project right and every project to some degree uh, would come to us with an interest in one or the other but but it was important for us to really try to infuse every project with each and every one of the values so design excellence um, is fairly obvious. Environmental responsibility, you know, we, we, we have transformed the firm since its founding um, and, and really have advanced an idea of uh, environmental responsibility through the practice with the addition of Z Smith um, as our director of sustainability and building performance. And, and, and so as Z as a leader has really um, had that filter out throughout the studio. I mean, I went to school in the 70s, and so I was in school for Earth Day, and certainly the awareness of the impact of the work that we do on the environment was significant. Um, but, uh, you know, we had always practiced intuitively, and I, I'd say Zeke transformed us from, a, from an intuitive kind of uh, uh, 
using intuition in the design process to one that's really about data uh, and understanding what the opportunities are. Uh, collaboration is pretty clear too, also uh, both inside the studio, outside with consultants, but also with our clients. Um, and I think that grew out of some of the work that I had done with Charles. We ended up uh, doing a, a church um, on the West Bank where we collaborated, collaborated with the entire congregation. And so we designed the church through a set of workshops um, over the course of uh, uh, a number of sessions in the church to design it. Um, and then community outreach. One of the things that, um, uh, that Alan uh, always spoke of was the idea that the firm uh, provided a platform and an opportunity for us to be involved in a wide variety of, of um, um, community, cultural, and professional uh, realms. And so there was a desire from the start to think of the firm as something that could have a tremendous impact. Uh, it, uh, but rather than just think of the firm through the lens of the work that we do, uh, there are opportunities for individuals to get involved. And so um, uh, he always promoted and we continue to promote the idea that, um, that the firm's a platform for civic engagement and that um, whether it's the principals or interns, there's an expectation and a desire that we all get involved at some level, right? Whether it's, um, whether it's one or two or ideally all three, you know, because we all can serve in a lot of different capacities and contribute outside the practice in a meaningful way. Now, you know, often that's, um, that takes the form of pro bono work. That's an obvious uh, example of it as well. In addition to the kind of volunteerism that we do uh, professionally or uh, civically, um, the, the firm has always been involved in pro bono efforts, but usually those efforts are things that come to one of the principles where somebody might ask, can you, can you give us some assistance um, uh, on a particular project? We've kind of, uh, and so we've had opportunities to do that. Um, obviously, many of them post Katrina, whether it was uh, the Make It Right initiative that Brad Pitt uh, began or Prospect One, where we donated our time uh, to Prospect to do this welcome center. There's always been an opportunity um, because somebody always had a need and, and was connected enough to the firm to reach out and call. Um, one of the major transformations in the practice um, and actually, uh, Jose Alvarez, another principal, led this effort was to think about um, pro bono service as something that rather uh, that that it not be episodic and not come to the practice just um, when somebody needs us, but to think of it as an opportunity to reach out to the community. And so um, we we took what we would normally have as a as a holiday on MLK Day and thought of it as an opportunity to contribute our time to nonprofits that might need an architect's service. So it wasn't to diminish the, um, the importance or the, or the need that we have always played, whether it was through the PRC or others where you, you know, paint a house or you know, use it as a day of service. In this case, we thought that um, we could contribute much more significantly thinking about what is it that an architect does? What are we uniquely capable of doing? And so we instituted a day of service where we reached out to the nonprofits in the community and asked them for proposals um, to come in. How would you use a day of an architect's time? And so we, we, we solicited proposals, receive, usually we get about a dozen or so. And then we, uh, we do a survey monkey and we, we shortlist down to about four and we have four teams that get together and work over the course of um, a day intensely where the entire studio is involved. But, um, and you know, it's a, a hands-on day of charrette. We all know what that looks like. But it also is an opportunity to have young staff lead projects and think of it as a 
program also for leadership development because it's, it doesn't happen in a day. Um, we have uh, staff that get in, invested with our partners months in advance to plan for the day to understand their program so that when we do sit down and go to work, those staff are leading the projects, the junior staff are leading the projects and leading the conversation with the client because they've been with them from the start. And so um, oftentimes we'll, we'll work on that day of service and then there's some time that gets added to the back. Uh, and you know, it's, it's incredibly um, uh, proud to look at this list of nonprofits that we have worked uh, worked with over the last six years, 25 nonprofits that we've been able to contribute to. So that's been a pretty significant part of the practice, growing out of this idea that um, an investment in community is critical. Um, now, it's easy to say, well, you know, Katrina was an initiator, but Al actually Alan was advocating for that much earlier than, than Katrina. I, I touch on Katrina because as a as an event, it really did change the trajectory in addition to the investment in, um, in community outreach. It also was an opportunity um, for us to think uh, a little differently about practice. We grew from a, from a practice of about 20 or so to a practice of about 50 now. And in that time, as we were growing, uh, Z joined uh, the office and uh, uh, we, we instituted a research fellowship that he manages. Uh, we as a group determine what we're going to spend our time and energy looking at, but we actually bring in two fellows that, um, uh, that spend, um, usually if it's two fellows, one spends a summer and one spends a full year. Uh, with us, we've had a couple of instances where we've just had a one year fellow and not not had a, a summer fellow, um, but they're topics that are important to us as a practice that oftentimes you don't have the time to really invest in. And so what we've done is we've established the fellowship. Um, the research fellows are not working on projects, they're working on research, but it's applied research that we're able to feed back into the studio. And so uh, they get involved in projects, not billable, uh, to projects, but as a resource, they give lectures, they gather um, uh, material on the subject matter, and you can kind of see the range of things that we've looked at over the years. Um, and it really has, a, has had a significant and transformative impact um, on, the, on the practice because it, it has afforded us a chance to sometimes think differently about things that are um, uh, now emerging. Like, for instance, with this pandemic, health in the built environment, which we looked at in 2015, um, has a huge impact. And the research that was done then uh, has, has been folded into our practice since that time. Um, the way in which we work now with Revit models, um, giving us data and information early in the design process has meant that we're able to do very quick analysis and uh, Z likes to call um, the image on the right uh, at the bottom a nutrition label for architecture, right? And so we can see what the energy impacts are for, uh, for uh, a design proposal. Um, these were done, this was a competition at Georgia Tech where we had two parallel schemes that we winnowed down from a, a quite a large number using analysis, using uh, not only intuition and the sense of, of making uh, design choices based on our intuition, but also on data. Um, and so all, all of this now plays into the practice. And as a result, we've been a signatory to the 2030 commitment for a number of years. Um, and, and we've watched our, um, our impact uh, increase um, now, we don't always hit the mark. Um, you know, these images on the right sort of show where we are on various projects. We publish it, we keep it on the website. Oftentimes, when we go back and do this data and we measure it, it gives us an opportunity to find uh, an area where we may have fallen short, 
either something's not operating correctly and we're able to reach back out to the client, or we, we get a chance to understand um, for future projects how we can improve. So all of those are really critical and important to the way in which we work. So this idea of impact now, um, uh, rather than the core values, when we talk about what we can accomplish and what are the influences on the practice, we start to think of them maybe slightly differently, but, uh, but to a large degree, while, while they're not uh, a one-to-one -one relationship to the core values, I think these still drive the practice, these ideas of, of working in a place and, and uh, uh, how place and time can impact uh, our, our work, uh, performance obviously, the idea of community and, and equity as well. Um, so. This is awesome. Um, I, I'm highly impressed. I, I know a lot that he's been doing. They've been helping, your, your firm's been helping out significantly with the AIA 2030 Challenge Symposium in November. I don't think we would have been able to achieve half if we hadn't had Z and Kelsey and Javier on our team, which are all, you know, part of the EDR community. Um, you spoke a little bit about the how things equate after or actually in, in reference to the um, pandemic, which is something that you had done in 2015 with the, you know, the healthier buildings. Do you see anything else that in the future, and, and you've actually spoken and you've already invested in the 2030 climate, 2030 challenge. Um, is there any other architectural evolving potential that you see? I mean, I think you've pretty much cleared it, but I mean, uh, you know, have, have uh, explained it, but is there anything else that comes to mind about what, what you see for the future of architecture? Well, I think that, um, you know, for, for us, the, um, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to look back on, on some of the research that we had done. Um, uh, obviously, this question of healthy building is, is one thing. I think that it, it really does change the conversation. We've had a number of conversations with clients. In fact, many of them right after we uh, came, came back and uh, after the first month, not coming back uh, to the office, but re-engaging with clients, that conversation about now, now tell us about the, um, the environment that we're creating, what are the HVAC systems that we have in place, all of the technical concerns were pretty obvious. Right. Um, I think the, uh, the, the questions about workplace and, and health in the workplace, you know, we started that a long time ago, we've been instituting it for a while. Those are all pretty clear and we've been able to advocate uh, to clients for healthy environments and, 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 and so that, that's been a part of the practice. I think the question of, um, of the pandemic and, and the impact should be a triggering event for us to understand this question of climate change. You know, we're, we're dealing with um, uh, habitat loss and, and you know, certainly people are building in places and putting ourselves closer uh, uh, to wildlife and animals than we ever did before. And, and those animals are losing habitat. And as a result, we're having this issue of transfer. Um, and I, so I think while, while we're not talking about it necessarily, uh, we're not talking about the pandemic necessarily as an issue of, of um, climate change or environmental uh, sustainability, I think the two are fundamentally linked and right. should be. So it's one of those things where um, uh, I see in the future, as we continue to look at storms, as we continue to look at now the wildfires, as we continue to look at these, you know, it, it's it, when there's a vaccine and when we get past this pandemic, we'll all go back to work and, and many people will forget and it'll be easy to, to put it behind us. But in reality, the changes are going to start to are going to continue to occur at greater frequency, and it's going to be something that we can't simply ignore. That's really a wonderful, good point you just made. It, it no matter what 
we are forever changed and will continue to have to transform based upon what's happening in our, in our, in our climate and our circling back on um, the examples, which I think you illustrated, but just to clarify some of the examples of how that, how your philosophy is represented in your work. I think you touched upon all the different things that you've done within your firm and the types of projects, but is there anything else that you wanted to elaborate upon um, for how your philosophy is represented? Well, I thought I could share, um, there's, there's a couple of projects that we have on the boards that, okay. um, that <laughs> might be useful in, uh, in kind of going through, but before, you know, this idea of, of practice in New Orleans, um, this Faulkner quote has always been a great touchstone for me, you know, the, the, the past is not dead, in fact, it's not even past. I think we all can kind of understand that. Um, so this idea of history and the idea of, of, of the present um, and, and history always being present for us uh, is important. I, I pull this up. It reminds me of a, of a joke a friend used to tell um, about uh, how many New Orleanians does it take to change a light bulb? And, and of course, it's three, but uh, the answer is, uh, one to change the bulb and two to reminisce about how wonderful the old bulb was. Yeah, that's so true. So, you okay. know, we, we, we practice in a place that has an incredibly rich history and people love the history and oftentimes our clients um, will want to see things that, uh, that are a continuation of that history. And I think this idea of architecture, and this goes all the way back to Bob Heck, um, uh, in undergraduate school, but the idea of architecture being uh, um, being driven by a set of ideas and relationships to uh, a time and a place and a zeitgeist is really important. And if we ignore that and try to replicate a past, it, um, it not only diminishes the past, but doesn't add anything of quality to the future. And, um, you know, we I think as a as a firm, we're very optimistic about the future. We we'll want to be forward looking as it relates to the work that we can do and the way in which it contributes. So you know that there's a lot of examples. Um, uh, many f uh, are those that folks know uh, from around the city, some from around the region. And, and you know, in in Bentonville, we just completed a new school, which was incredibly transformative um, because as we were designing the school. Uh, the school was designing the pedagogy for it. And so it was a chance to, to work uh, to create a collection of spaces and landscapes and buildings that were building on an idea of what uh, uh, education uh, could be. So, you know, these were all really, uh, really informative and critical uh, to our practice. Um, we have a project on the boards right now that uh, is really interesting for us. We just completed design development. We're getting ready to start construction documents. And it's a new US courthouse in Greenville, Mississippi, uh, which we are working with Duval Decker out of Jackson, Mississippi. It's a collaboration between our two firms. Um, and, and, you know, this idea of, of time and place and equity and community is all kind of, and, and and performance for a building as well as design excellence is all kind of bound up in this in this example. Um, you know, back in 1789, uh, uh, there was only a Supreme Court that was uh, uh, identified as, as, as part of the founding, uh, but the Judicial Act in 1789 established the idea of district courts that would be uh, built out away from uh, the center of government uh, away from the Supreme Court um, and would adjudicate in the colonies. Uh, and at the time, and you can see from this watercolor, you know, at the time, this was all rural vernacular architecture. And so how do you establish a civic vision for um, the federal government? And Jefferson chose to um, uh, capture it in uh, the neoclassical ideas of of Greece and Rome. Um, so the idea of democracy being represented by a classical language 
meant that that was the unique building within a landscape. And so it became the kind of focus for uh, an, entire, an entire region. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court actually wasn't built until much, much later, um, 1932, but, you know, clearly it represents the idea of this classical style um, and the representation that architecture can have of justice and authority uh, being represented in a style. And we're, we're actually at an interesting time because we're, we're almost back to the idea of a federal style. Uh, this project is being run through the GSA and, and back in the 60s in the Kennedy administration, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan established uh, the GSA guidelines for design excellence for federal buildings. Um, and in that uh, set of guidelines, not only is there nothing about a federal style, but um, the document takes great pains to state that a federal style should be avoided um, and that the, uh, the architecture should grow from the profession, not from the government. But we're back at this conversation right now with the idea of an executive order that would um, institute a, a classical style on all governmental buildings. So it's an interesting cycle. The, the fact that we're building this project in Greenville, Mississippi, and the notion of a classical um, architecture um, does have a powerful set of meanings, and we can look to the past to understand them. But at the same time, that style has been, was co-opted over time and became the predominant style uh, that was built um, through the era of slavery and the plantations. And so, and I could show slides today, you know, Caesar, Caesar's Palace is an example now. And so, you know, the, the style has been completely co-opted, um, but different, different individuals, different societies and different cultures might view an architecture through a lens uh, that is different than the intentional lens that Jefferson had when establishing initially the idea of these district courts. And so for um, a community in the Mississippi Delta, the idea of a classical style might have a different representation of, of authority, um, might not have a representation of justice. Uh, and so it forced us to ask a question, what is the appropriate style of a new federal courthouse in Mississippi, and in particular in Mississippi in the Delta? Um, you know, after the flood of 1927, um, uh, it kind of upended uh, society at the time. Um, and, and the sharecropping aspect of uh, slavery that was prevalent then, the idea that, um, uh, that there needed to be the maintenance of a certain kind of, of um, agrarian uh, experience uh, was, was reflected and it was an incredibly difficult time and certainly the idea that, um, that a classical architecture as a representation of um, a new federal courthouse might, might have a, a different um, uh, sense depending upon where you sat uh, in a social order or social spectrum. So what we looked at instead was the idea of a set of architectural cues and spatial cues that are understandable you know, the expression of civic authority as represented by the Montgomery County Courthouse as classic single room courthouse as providing a procession from the public realm to the ceremonial court um, was something, and, and the identity of the court, right, as in captured in a single building image was really important. Um, of course, courthouses today are not single room courthouses. This is a double uh, courtroom courthouse, which is still rather small. 
but uh, you can see the, the courts are represented in this blue. No longer is a courthouse represented by a courtroom. There's a lot of office building components, U.S. Marshals, a very complicated program with a lot of different tenants. So it's as much an office building today as it is a ceremonial courthouse. So how do you um, project the idea of identity of the federal judiciary in a building that is um, as complicated uh, and infused with such um, office and security components uh, as we have? And so what we decided to do with the program is separate out the, uh, the courtroom program from the remainder of the program. So you can see how, uh, how disparate those, that percentage is between those two. And, and then as we began to look at the site, which is up against the levee in a downtown that has been decimated uh, since the 20s, the idea that the identity of the court inside, um, uh, inside a courthouse building and you can see Jefferson's single courtroom figure up there at the top, that identity we chose to pull away from a bar building that houses all of the other support functions of the court. And as a result, we were able to now create a very clear identity for the courts themselves. They are housed stacked on top of one another in a wood line box which actually is a set of louvers that'll allow light to filter into the courtrooms uh, behind those louvers with a glass screen around them that almost operates as uh, a lens. So this idea of lanterns on the levee and the way in which that analogy represents justice, uh, you know, a, the light of justice um, could be represented through something that's much more open and engaging to the community rather than for voting. Um, the bar building behind has a little bit more of a classical order to it, uh, but done in a very contemporary uh, way. And so that houses all of this, the functions that support the um, uh, activities of the court. And so there's the site, there's the river. This is uh, uh, actually an Oxbow Lake now, but it was the original river. Um, there's our site. <clears throat> they do have a big tamale festival um, that they have every year. And uh, so we decided that it would be important to maintain the idea of a park. And so the courtroom sort of sits in this garden. Um, and so this will be the tamale festival in, uh, what is it, 2024, I believe, maybe 23. I'll have to go back and look at the schedule. Um, one other project I'll touch on uh, is uh, a project that we uh, now have under construction in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, we were invited <clears throat> to a competition. Um, well, we, we were invited to submit credentials and we ended up working our way through the process and got shortlisted and competed against two other firms um, uh, to to do this work. And so this was a, is a museum up in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, incredible site. Uh, originally was part of a park. So uh, Mr. Bruce uh, owned this house on the left, um, a stone mansion on the top of the hillside. And he had all of the property around, um, uh, around the, the site was the, a park that he donated to the town uh, with the donation stipulating that the, the house would become a museum of art and science. Uh, so this idea of pairing art and science together um, uh, was a really interesting aspect of it. Again, the, the, the site, um, rather large park with parking in it, but you can start to see the rock outcroppings that are part of that landscape. You know, we don't often get to work in topography like this. Usually topography means a six inch rise over what, a mile and a half, something like that. So it's pretty interesting going, going someplace where when you drive onto the park, uh, the house sits 30 feet higher than uh, the entry drive. So um, 
what we decided for the competition, the jumping off point would be the idea of the ecology and geology of the Connecticut coastline. And so this idea of this post-glacial scouring that, repre uh, that is represented by the rock outcroppings that show up all over um, the site was the starting point. We had to do two, um, two options for the competition, two schemes. Um, the idea of, of geology and stone was part of both schemes. And so you can kind of see on the left, one was we named quarry, the other we named lace. Uh, quarry, there are a lot of granite quarries up and down the Connecticut coastline. You don't have to go far from the site to find them. <clears throat> um, lace is farmers uh, picking up stones out of the field and stacking them. And for some reason, in this part of the country, they, they stacked them up and made walls that are as much air as stone. Um, and so the, the, you know, you can see light and air through them. Uh, I mentioned art early, you know, these were all inspirations uh, as we began to explore uh, the competition and the competition entries. And where we ended up was a hybrid of the two schemes. Um, this shows uh, a granite quarry um, a little bit further, uh, but still uh, in the Northeast. And the operations that we took to present to the client the kind of carving of a mass and the creation of an architecture uh, that would represent the museum. And so uh, we went from a stone project to um, a cast stone, precast project, uh, partly for budget, but also partly because of the um, ability to use the material, the medium of, of uh, precast concrete in a very plastic way to begin to represent shade and shadow in these textures. Um, and so the transformation though of the museum from daytime to nighttime uh, through the lace wall that you circulate up from a new entry that's in the park and connects more to the community um, uh, is represented here in this evening view. So, so those those two projects, I think, um, uh, are what I wanted to wanted to share. They're they're kind of fresh on the boards, um, you know, in, in two different states, but they start to represent, I think, uh, a range of interests and ways in which we think about the work. You know, you started with the um, the phenomenology of the experience of the memory. And have no, you know, especially down here in New Orleans, the joke about the three light, the how many people it takes to change a light bulb, and then you ended up with a project about the phenomenology of materiality, which I think is is outstanding and something I'm hugely interested in. Was my thesis, um, so I think that is a beautiful transition and uh, sort of an overwhelming section cut of how you and your firm work in such a palatable manner. Um, we have uh, seven minutes left, and I don't know if anyone wants to ask any questions, so I have to look in the chat box. Yeah, um, we, do have, we do have one question here um, from a friend, Lopez, uh, asking, how do we inspire the next generation of young people to pursue becoming architects? And how do you create a similar allure to the profession that law or medicine could have? That's a great question. And, um, you know, as a, as a practice, we've been really interested in investing and understanding, uh, you know, you spend five years or sometimes a lot more in architecture school. It's a, it's a really critical aspect um, of becoming licensed is, uh, you know, is the end goal. It's not simply going to architecture school and getting the degree. And so we consistently promote it um, here in the firm. We, we support it. We, uh, we like to celebrate the accomplishments as well. So when, when our staff are licensed, uh, we usually make a pretty big deal out of it. I have a slide that shows the embarrassing hats and things that we make people wear at the Christmas party when they've gotten licensed. But you know, it's really just a time to celebrate an accomplishment because it really is a milestone. So we, um, 
we also have conversations for our annual reviews with all staff. And we ask them to tell us about their licensure process. Uh, we want them to have a plan and um, we don't want to dictate a plan for anybody, but we do expect that, uh, that young staff, young unlicensed staff uh, establish a roadmap for them to get licensed. We, we support them in a lot of different ways through that process, um, uh, but we check in with them uh, at least on an annual basis, if not more than that, to make certain that they are accomplishing their goals in the program that they laid out. So um, it's, it's really important to us because I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a critical milestone of what it takes to be a profession, a professional and becoming licensed is something that we really want to support and celebrate. I don't have any secrets for, for how someone would do it now. I mean, when I took the test, it was, uh, it was like the baton death march. Everybody could only take it at one time during the year and um, it's only offered once and um, you had to take all of the tests in a four day period. Um, I do think now with the, the testing methodology that they have, sometimes they make it, make it a little easier. Um, while it's easier to take the test, it's also easier not to take the test because it, it can be taken any time. So um, I, I think it just, it just requires an awareness and it requires for all of us who are uh, principals or architects or firm owners, um, the need to continue to ask and, um, and support our younger staff to become licensed. Great. Good answer. Um, if there are no other questions, are there any other comments that you would like to make, Steve? Because I have been thoroughly impressed as usual and I'm once again incredibly grateful for you to take the time out of your day. Oh, good. So is there anything anything else that you wanna please mention, let us know. And well I wanna I wanna thank everybody in our practice because um, you know, I'm I'm the guy who gets to gets to um, uh, talk about this. I'm not the only person in the firm that, that does it, but um, you know, for those of us who do, uh, it, it takes the support and the work of a lot of people behind us. Um, you know, they're the folks that are making this stuff happen. And in many cases, um, uh, you know, they're the folks who are driving the practice. And so I'm, I'm excited, again, optimistic about the future because we've got a great uh, collection of staff here in the studio, probably the best collection of talent that we've ever had. So um, for those of uh, uh, you know, my staff that are on the call, I want to congratulate them and give them a shout out because they're the folks who make it happen. Okay. Um, I think that ends it. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Like I said before, um, was making sure, uh, Lauren, if there's any more questions. I only see one, so I think that's it. And um, I want everybody to please give us uh, best wishes on World Architecture Day, Steve. <laughs> and thank you again. Well, thanks again. Yeah. For, thank you for, so much, Steve. Well, thank you all. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, so thanks for, thanks for asking me. And thanks all the people at EDR for letting us have them for an hour and for doing such incredible work. Absolutely. This was a real treat. Um, and we'll just wrap things up by uh, highlighting the upcoming events we have this month. We have another webinar on Wednesday. There are two different small firm exchange meetings, um, a webinar roundtable uh, highlighting the state and local disadvantaged business enterprise programs in the city. Uh, a WIA event featuring the FAA Women of the Gulf Coast, and then of course our 2020 Design Awards Ceremony, uh, which will happen on October 29th, and we'd love to see you all tune into that. Um, and other than that, Steve and Terry, thank you again so, so much. And we hope that everybody has just a, a stellar rest of your day. <laughs> all right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.